welcome to our very first episode of Old Schooling Commentary. Today's episode is going to be a very special one for those who are celebrating uh, Passover. We are going to be doing commentary on the 1995 TV special A Rugrats Passover. And what better way to have this than alongside with one of the writers and of course one of the co-creators of Rugrats, Paul Germain. Thanks for being here, Paul. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. This episode debuted on April 13th, 1995. In a sense, we're going to be watching, you know, what many people consider to be one of the best holiday specials that ever featured on Nickelodeon. So, uh, without further ado, everybody hop in the Rugrats Passover special. Paul, when deciding about the idea of having a Rugrats uh, Passover special, well, what were the ideas on wanting to um, put the, t the idea together on the, um, the episode? The initial issue was that uh, Nickelodeon wanted to do a, had, had us do a Christmas special the year before, and it had done so well for them that they asked us to do a Hanukkah special. Some of the staff writers and I, who were Jewish, uh, we all said, you know, if you really want to capture a Jewish holiday that's equivalent to Christmas, it's not Hanukkah. Hanukkah's at the same time as Christmas, the same time of year. But Passover is the really important holiday in Judaism, at least for us growing up that way. And so we pitched doing a uh, Passover episode. Nickelodeon bought off on it, and we started working on it. One of the questions that I was wondering about, Paul, was there were four writers involved with the Passover special. You know, which person took in charge of what part of the story? Well, we didn't work that way. Uh, we basically all worked together, and we all did everything. I don't think that any one person was in charge of one character, for example, or one part of the story. We all just put it together, and honestly, it's so many years ago, I don't even remember how we sat down to write it, whether somebody did a first draft or a couple of people did or whether we all went over it together. I just don't even remember. What I do remember is that we all um, kind of formulated the plot, you know, did figured out the beats of the story and how it would go and who would say what, all kind of sitting around a table. We all did it together. Now, Rugrats was being watched by numerous people, people who were both kids and adults, and maybe for the most part, people who maybe weren't Jewish. So how were you able to get the sense of creating a Passover episode that would not be would only be good for people who were Jewish celebrating Passover, but for everybody else who didn't even celebrate Passover or didn't know what Passover was? What we all decided we wanted to do with the story was to tell it in our own way, to kind of put a spin on it and tell it in a funny new way, which was using the Rugrats characters as if they were the characters in the Passover story. So, for example, Angelica is Pharaoh. That's perfect because she thinks of herself as a kind of a king or a queen, right? Yep. And Tommy as Moses. He seems obviously the leader. So, really, we were using our own experiences um, with the holiday, which we'd all had for years and years, and just figuring a funny way to tell it. What people so there was a combination of things, right? There's kind of two way, two parts of the story. One is the frame around the story. You know, this kind of or, you know, Grandpa going upstairs and getting locked away and everyone gradually coming upstairs and hearing him telling his funny version of the story just orally, right? And then you have everyone downstairs, you know, the, the adults downstairs sitting around the table, Haggadah, going through the book and kind of telling the story in the traditional way and it's kind of a little bit dull. And then you have Grandpa kind of in a more lively way telling the story from memory in his own way. All of us contributed to all of those two parts. Passover is... A very interesting holiday because it's about freedom. It's about declaring your independence and becoming independent and becoming free. Right. And, of course, the, the first beginning towards the episode, you have uh, Boris and Minka preparing the cedar and preparing the dinner. Were any of these experiences of you growing up, you know, going through the preparations of Passover, did it reflect on the episode? I think that some of the other writers had their own experiences with it. For me, it was more related to experiences that I remember from a friend who I would always spend Passover with and her experiences with her family and kind of fighting over at, at, over Passover and yet it always turning out kind of great, you know, that all these, these conflicts leading up to something, to this great telling of the story. So it was more something that I didn't experience from my own family but from someone else's. 
Uh, what made you decide that, you know, we've seen Boris and Minka, you know, argue numerous occasions and then eventually they start getting along with one another. What made you decide to go into this route when telling the first half of the story of this episode? Well, you know, you're always looking for a funny kind of conflict and a funny problem to start your episode with. And, uh, you know, we always look for something kind of amusing and, and troubled and a problem to start to start the story. And this one just seemed like a funny way in to this story to us. I, I think that's the best I can tell you about that. Now, it's interesting about how Chaz is in this episode, and he's not particularly uh, religious at all, and yet he's brought into this Passover dinner. Is that kind of like a reflection towards us, you know, for the people who are not Jewish at all? That way we can be able to have some sort of relatable person that we can kind of go towards for people who aren't um, religious or Jewish and they're able to um, you kind of like see from their perspective of somebody who is? I think it's more about just, you know, the idea that Passover is, is an inclusive holiday. It's for everyone. You know, if you come to a, a Seder, the, the, the tradition is that everyone is welcome. And if anyone comes to the door, he's welcome to be part of the, of the Seder. And so we just wanted to say it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your history is. This is a story that can interest you. This is a story you can learn about world history and about tradition and about this, 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 this faith, whether it's your faith or not. Yes, um, I think that one of the great things about Passover or any other particular religion in general is that even though that we don't follow certain criterias of the religion or if we're not from that religion, then we can be able to find at least one common thing that we can learn from. And I think with Passover's uh, message about being free, you know, it doesn't have to be like being free uh, when the Egyptians were um, slaving the Jews on during the ancient times. I mean, we can be free from numerous occasions. Absolutely. That was our thinking, you know, that, that it, one of the reasons that it was fun to just sort of have our cast of characters be the various characters in the Passover story, you know, having, having uh, Tommy be Moses, having Angelica be the Pharaoh, was that it just sort of, it sort of framed it in a way that anybody could relate to, that you could, that this story is a kind of a universal story. And not only that, but I think for anybody who is not interested in doing something like the Cedar, like Stu is doing, in which he's just reading through the book, he doesn't care about what the message is, I'm sure that people have at least one point or another been able to gone through something like that. Right. And it's kind of fun, as you see here, that here's Grandpa stuck in this attic. He can't get out, and he's got the kids, and he starts to tell the story. And they all relate to it, even though downstairs everybody's kind of following this this ceremony, and Stu is bored out of his mind. <laughs> the yes. story kind of works anyway, and you get into the story from this from this weird kid point of view. Now, when the telling of the story of Passover, did you kind of put in your twist into... The Ten Commandments, directed by Cecil DeMille, or did you want to take in like your own uh, ways of how you were able to learn about Passover from when of, of how you were taught, or is it just like a different idea in general? I think we were we were thinking in terms of sort of of uh, a little bit of our own experiences as uh, from childhood, and also parodying the way that Passover is is, you know, tr you know parody parodying something like the, the movie The Ten Commandments and just sort of having fun with it. So here you go, we're going back into Egypt and, you know, and, 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 uh, and there's Angelica as the, as the pharaoh. It just, it just makes it all kind of, kind of funny, you know. It's just a funny way of seeing it. So it's based a little bit on the, on the old tradition and it's based I mean, on, on the old cliches, I want to say, and also based on our own understanding of it and our own quirky way of telling the story. Right. And, of course, you know, not everything is taken into liberty. Like, you know, the Pharaoh doesn't meet with Moses because in the Bible, Moses and Pharaoh are like a few years apart. So in that case, it wouldn't be as relevant. But I guess it kind of makes sense because we want to get the story of flowing with um, yeah, Moses yeah. and the Pharaoh meeting up with one another. And just like the way that Angelica and the Sphinx are shaped up like that is just hilarious. <laughs> There's lots of visual gags like that, yeah. Uh, I really love this one in which Chucky is building the pyramid, but then when you take a closer look at it, it's upside down. It's one of the best jokes. That's a Peter Gaffney joke. <laughs> I remember very clearly when he pitched it. 
I mean, and even though that it shouldn't make sense in the laws of physics, I mean, that thing would just crumble down, even if it was like a quarter way point. But just look at that. <laughs> It's a great gag. It's a great little gag, you know? The, 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 the great thing is you can tell the story a bunch of different ways, and that's legitimate in Judaism. You tell the story a bunch of different ways as long as you keep the essential element of saying, we're not going to be enslaved anymore, we are going to be free. You yeah. know, that is the key to the story. And, and it kind of is supposed to appeal to, 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 to people everywhere as a story about liberating yourself and becoming free. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting about how um, Angelica is able to treat Tommy very nicely. Well, in the original story, Pharaoh and Moses are friends. Yes. And then suddenly Moses turns on, uh, you know, turns and he becomes this, this, this representative of his people, and then he and Pharaoh are at odds with each other, and then God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Right. You know? Here we have the part in the story in which, you know, we have, um, you know, Tommy, who's playing as Moses, as uh, part of the Egyptian line, and he sees all of his uh, people, or the babies in this case, working as slaves. So it gives into this story on, you know, finding out that he is one of them, and, you know, at first he's reluctant to following what the babies are saying, but then when he sees them being treated cruelly, then he wants to let them go. And of course, another great gag in which, you know, Phil and Lil, two babies, and then they just crumble this gi big gigantic rock, which probably weighs like a million tons and half. Right. You know, it's a cartoon. You can do anything. Of course. <laughs> if you had the opportunity to do any of the other um, Jewish holidays, like Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or something? You know, we never thought we would be doing any other uh, holiday special. And when they did do the Hanukkah special, which was years after I left the show, it's an all right story, but it, it, it's not nearly as compelling or interesting or universal of a story as the Passover story is. The Passover story can sort of apply to anyone who, you know, thirsts for freedom. I'm not sure that the other stories are as universal as that one, at least for me. Wow, I mean, in that case, you know, we have, you know, him, the, the, the bigger baby pushing around Chuck, Chuck, Chucky and then just pushing the baby, in which in the original story, you know, Moses would have killed him, but I don't think that that's that would have... That's right. I th well, you see, that's that's sort of was the challenge of telling the story, is how do we tell it in this, you know, how do we reduce it down to its bare elements and tell it without violence and without cruelty, you know, and just kind of have fun with it. And, and the interesting thing is that you can do that, that you can tell the story that way, that it still becomes clear. You know, of course, the difficulties with, you know, the story of Moses especially, I think that one of the hard parts of it is that you need to be able to keep it toward the bare minimum, but at the same time able to tell the full story. And for no anybody else who isn't aware of what the story of Passover is, being able to teach them about how it was, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. And, of course, you know, we have this scene back with, um, you know, the, uh, the cedar, and nobody else is interested because uh, Stu is still struggling to read it. And then... Eventually, as time goes on, the, uh, the rest of the adults start coming up the attic. Yeah, everybody gets locked in the room and hears Grandpa's story, and, it's, and they're so moved by it. And then downstairs, it's all just going through this elaborate, formal thing, and everyone's bored. And <laughs> Stu has that line, what does it mean? <laughs> Which is one of my favorite parts of the, the scene coming up, I think. Um, yeah, so, so the idea was that it's the informal part of it that's kind of great. You know? Yes, and the informal part about it, as well as just telling it in your own perspective, is how it's able to become very synonymous for numerous people, even though they have no idea what it's about. And I just really enjoy the fact that Angelica is getting all of these treats, like the Cynthia doll and the fortune cookies, which is kind of, you know, very fitting for Angelica's part. Yeah, here comes the part, let my babies go. <laughs> We really had fun writing this. It was just, you know, just sort of parodying all the elements and still telling the story. And it was designed to be an introduction to Passover for anyone. What what we what we what we heard after th that that Passover special came out now after a few years, what we started hearing was that people were using the Passover um, special, the the Rugrats Passover special, to introduce Passover to their children. It was a great way for people, you know, to explain the story to their kids because it's kind of designed to do that. But consequently, it also works well to introduce the story to 
uh, to non-Jews who maybe never knew it before. It's a great way to, to sort of put it in a modern, in a goofy modern perspective and explain it, you know, without all the really violent parts. <laughs> You know, and the, the plagues, in, in, of course, in the Old Testament are horrible. You know, they're just terrible, frightening, violent things. And here they're just kind of goofy. Yeah. Um, how were you able to tone that down while at the same time giving the message that of the original plagues of Egypt? Well, we just did what you see here. We, we just made it on a small level and made it kind of silly instead of playing it as really terrible things, you know? It's not an accurate representation of what it might have been like, but it gives you a, it just sort of tells the story in a fun way, you know? Were there any plagues that you wanted to present, but you couldn't because of maybe limit uh, time uh, constraints or maybe that you couldn't do it because it would have been too much? Mostly time constraints. We knew what we, that we, we had to be careful, you know? We, we didn't want to do anything that was going to scare anybody. So, you know, and it's not, they're not going to murder the, you know, in the original story, the, the Egyptians kill the firstborn child of every, every family. We're not going to do that. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, well, of course not. No. So we, you know, you have to figure out a way to tell the story and put it in terms that aren't frightening, but convey the, the drama. I really like the lighting that's going on in the palace because it kind of gives that dark boating atmosphere in which you have the pharaoh who's kind of like shut in in this palace stubborn to her ways on you know wanting to let her people go but then not wanting to and then wanting to and not wanting to i, I just right. really think that the the mood really builds it yeah yeah thank you it, it was we had a lot of fun with this episode i think that a balance for humor and drama was really needed for something like passover because with the serious um tone that were the that the original plagues of egypt it's really scary, and, you know, having it shown f as its original raw form would have definitely scared a lot of younger people. Um, it's a really wonderful way of how this was able to build in um, the same amount of tension, but at the same time keeping it goofy, like we just saw previously with the frogs and the hail and the mosquitoes and the darkness. So, you know, we have the scene in which the babies are uh, painting the um, doorways, and we have the smoke. And, of course, we're not going to show that scene in which all the firstborns die, but, of course, you know, you're able to build around towards that with, you know, Angelica thinking that, oh, wait, I am a firstborn, so <laughs> I'm going to call my Egyptian phone and talk to my dad saying, hey, am I a firstborn? And I just love it. I mean, look at that. You see Drew, he's dressed in his modern clothes, and we have Angelica with her Egyptian clothes, and it's supposed to take place in ancient times. And she's wondering, like, am I the firstborn? It's like, yep, you are. And then Angelica's like, uh-oh, i got to do something about it. <laughs> yeah. What made you decide to do that kind of gag as opposed to just Angelica going over to um, Drew and Charlotte who are dressed up like Egyptians and, you know, her telling them, hey, am I a firstborn? And then they'll be like, uh-huh, yeah. Because it's funnier. I mean, for us, it was just, it was just this was the tone of the, of the series that, that, you know, you go back and forth when they, whenever the kids were having a fantasy, you know, you cut back and forth to reality and break all the rules. It's just a funny way of, do, of telling the story. We just thought it was hilarious. If they'd just been Egyptians, that could have been funny too, but this sort of had a, a flavor that really worked for us. And here's another one in which Chucky decides to wipe down the blood from the doorstep and... You know, saying, oh, I just found this markings on the door and I just cleaned it up for you. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a lot of that kind of, those kind of jokes. If Chucky building the Upside Down Pyramid, that's pure Peter Gaffney. I just happen to remember that was his joke. But, you know, everyone, you know, all four of us contributed a lot of different parts to it. That one just, that bit with the pyramid just sticks in my mind is something Peter came up with. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> And now she's running over towards uh, Tommy, or Moses in this case, saying that she changed her mind. Now she wants to let her people go. Right. And um, I was just wondering another question regarding about this. Um, you know, with um, the, f the family being locked up in the closet, I was wondering, do they ever get out? <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know. You know, I can't even remember that far back. I think I think that that we just figured you know we know they're going to get out we know they're not going to be stuck in there forever. It was more of a way of having them be in the closet was a way of getting us away from the formality of 
the satyr at the table and just telling the story in a casual way, which is which is incidentally a completely legitimate thing to do in Judaism. You just tell the the key is to tell the story, and 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 explain the important parts and talk about freedom and talk about liberation and how how we were freed. You know that the 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 formality of it, the you know, and the the seriousness of it is just not a real part of it. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be any way. Right, and that's what we were going for. So it was a it was a sort of a device, a comic device for getting us away from the table. And uh, now the rest of the family realizes, oh, there's nobody else here. Right, and then we, we carry on the story. And if you think about it, it's just a fun, it's just sort of a comic way of telling the story that we all learned from the movie or from our, you know, or from our childhoods. You know, yes, it's, it's the same thing. It just gets us to that point. Uh, the Pharaoh was always changing his mind because God was hardening his heart, you know? Right. So in this version, we just have this other way of doing it, but it gets us to the same story. Right, and we've all, and we've seen Angelica in previous episodes in which she served, like, you know, with Drew giving her things like the toys and um, serving her things like juice or cookies or something like that. And, you know, kind of seeing this, it kind of puts into perspective of... You know, Angelica being served constantly, and then eventually, you know, she learns this lesson about that, you know, not everybody's going to cater to her every whim. And now we have the entire family together. So, and yeah, see, this, is, this is a key moment in the story, because at this point, when all the adults sit down, it's like Grandpa's informal way of telling the story has sort of won out, and everybody really wants to just hear it, you know? Yeah, even though that they've already heard it at some point or another, like hundreds of times, they're just interested in, you know, Grandpa Boris's telling of it because it's just so interesting about how it's played out. You know, the babies play it out like this epic adventure with a whole bunch of babies, and the adults, even though that they've, you know, read through the informal book about how Passover was through the cedar, we're able to have them be interested in the story all over again. Yeah. And now here's the scene in which uh, Tommy opens up the Red Sea and they're rushing towards the other side until the Pharaoh comes by. Yeah, I, I really like the way it kind of plays into the old classic traditional story about the baby, the, 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 the Hebrews having to run towards their freedom and then Pharaoh's chasing after them. And then, you know, through um, God, um, Moses is able to close the Red Sea and the Pharaoh is defeated. And here's one of the best gags in the entire episode. <laughs> the shark. Shark ate the doll. Oh, uh, yeah. We had a lot of fun with this. We had a lot of fun writing this. Everything is all hunky-dory, but unfortunately, the one of the biggest things that happens is that the door shuts again. And they're all locked in. Yep, and they're all locked in. I guess, you know, instead of the telling of, you know, the 40 years of wandering in the desert... He decides to talk about how his relatives first met and they were locked in the cabin and it was freezing. And so, what's great about that is that it relates real life, you know, the life that, that people have to this ancient, you know, this ancient tale. You know, it takes it and it kind of brings it down to a normal level. Now they're just human beings and he's telling a story about something that happened to him in Russia, you know? Um and that's a great way, that too is just a great way to relate how this ancient tale works for our entire lives. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, that is the end of that episode. Yeah, you know, with, with 20 years after the Passover special came out, a lot of people still fondly remember it, not only as an introduction towards the Passover special, but just... You know, the fact that it was, you know, from a show that a lot of people grew up with. And it's one of the very few Passover specials, let alone Jewish holidays, that are uh, being celebrated in any form of media, which is something to be very commended for. I did a re video yeah. recently on the five reasons why the Passover special meant a lot to me. That's very cool. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think right. that you guys did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun, and I hope that you enjoyed this commentary. And, Paul, once again, thank you so much for uh, being here. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you guys in the next episode. So take care.